Hi again, this is Jeffrey Smith, and we're with Kathleen Halal with an incredibly great story of removing toxic insecticides from Irvine, California. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good morning. Good morning. And now, you have a great story, and I'm really excited for you to share it. Before you get into the details, what was your motivation and what got you started into what turned out to be one of the more successful stories in this country? about blocking the toxic sprays in your community? Well, my children have had autoimmune issues growing up. So I started really paying attention to what they were eating and what was in their environment as a way to make my own children healthier. And uh, then I started to just be more aware of my community. And uh, specifically at school, I noticed these warning signs for the pesticides that they would put up periodically when they would spray. And I would notice how the kids were just playing right around the signs and the adults were walking right past and it was as if they were invisible. No one was paying attention to the fact that there had been a pesticide sprayed. And I started to ask, why are we having these things sprayed around our children? Why do we need them? And uh, so I started to look into it and I started to talk to maintenance and I, I started to try to change things. So. Um, it started early on. I started noticing it around school. Excellent, excellent. Now, your campaign was rather sophisticated. You got involved. You, you started on your own. Um, how long did you were on your own before you attracted a team? Well, I was on my own for about two years uh, working on this. I, um, I was elected uh, the head of health and safety by my city's PTA. And so I would go to all the PTA president's board meetings and the council meetings and, uh, you know, we would learn about all kind of the bigger issues in our district, what was going on. And I decided to take health and safety pretty seriously and I brought in speakers about pesticides. Uh, I brought in a farmer to talk about food and pesticide use and I brought in a pediatrician to talk about pesticides effects on children. And then periodically, if articles would come out or things would happen, I would uh, pass out the information to all the PTA presidents and the school board members and let them know that, you know, these things aren't great for kids and kind of what are we doing in the district and can we change things. Mm -hmm. So I worked on that for about two years. It took a long time to get people on board and, and have them come along with me. And then eventually the PTA presidents voted unanimously to... Uh, support my request to go before the school board and speak with them about this. Let's do this systematically because other people are going to want to replicate what you've done. Now you you actually did a community recruiting um, and organization angle. Other people have been successful sometimes making one call to a decision maker who was on side and just to, they just wanted to know the information and they created alternatives. But what you've done is you've actually not just made decision makers see the light, but actually many decision makers, community members who might be using things like Roundup on their lawn before they spoke with you. So it's a, it's a much bigger approach. Why don't you take us through the systematic presentation that will help others replicate what you've done? Well, um, kind of, I, I think that you know, the whole thing is everybody has to go out in their community and, and kind of feel it out. And uh, if you need to join a group, join a group. If you need to get a group together, get the group together. Um, or if you can work on your own and you know the decision makers, then more power to you. That could be the best way to go in and do this. But um, I'm going to speak a little bit in my presentation about how you can approach this, how I approached it, and how other people can approach it and sort of uh, get the education and the materials you'll need to move forward. Uh, the, the basic premise is that no matter where anyone is coming from in my journey, I found that everybody cares about the health of children. This is common ground and the health of our community. And it's, it's hard to argue that we shouldn't try to make things safer for everyone. Uh, everybody knows someone who has cancer or there are, you know, children now over 54% of U.S. children have a chronic uh, 
uh, health condition, and that's according to the CDC. That's probably a very conservative issue, but if we look around, you know, all of us know a child who has something going on, and so this is the this is the impetus that that everyone should work forward from. That this is this is common ground, no matter who you're talking to, and um, get your information and then move forward in however you feel comfortable in your community. All right. So why don't you share your presentation now, and then we'll. Um, okay post some of the resources online as well. Okay. Okay, so I've created a blueprint here on how to create a non-toxic community. Um, let's make every town safe for the smallest among us. It is my sincerest wish that everybody take this message and do what you can in your community to bring about change, to stop the use of pesticides in such a casual manner. Um, I feel as though people are using these lawn products and things for basically cosmetic landscaping and not thinking about the ramifications, the ramifications for the applicator, the ramifications for the children, the pets, the elderly, and everyone in our community. So this is all about first raising awareness and um, then moving forward to try and make changes so that people can switch over to organic practices that are less toxic for everyone involved. The, the very beginning of my journey sort of in the decision making in Irvine after I had been a member of the PTA for years and was on the board as director of health and safety um, the PTA for my city gave me permission to go in front of the school board in their name and make a request that the district stop using all toxic pesticides around our children um, and so you know, I would suggest if you have a church group or some kind of community group or even just a friend, um, try to find people who see things the way you do and are also looking around and thinking, are there things we can change? Are there things we can do better in our community for especially the children? Okay, so I've put together a blueprint to create a non-toxic community. And my wish is that people take this on in every town across the nation and even abroad, that people start to raise awareness in their community to get people thinking about what they're applying around our families. This is a benefit to everyone in the community from the people applying the pesticides to the children, elderly, pets, just everybody. So let's make every town safe for the smallest among us. Uh, the first part of the stage is gather a group it may even mean just getting a partner, but find someone in your community who agrees with you and, and has noticed the pesticide use and believes this is an issue and that we need to be uh, working in our communities to make change, to cut back on everything that's being applied. In this case, this is a, a, an image of the flyer that I created uh, for the PTA meeting. I was elected by my PTA to go in front of the school board and speak on their behalf to ask the school district to stop their use of toxic pesticides for the groundskeeping. Um, a lot of the reason that I uh, made good ground with the school board is because uh, right at the end of my term, um, the World Health Organization came out with their monograph on glyphosate and they said that glyphosate was a probable carcinogen. And what happened was they said that it, they determined it was definitely carcinogen in mammals and animals and probably in humans. And this major decision came through and helped me to push through um, the decision by the district to drop toxic pesticides. Here's my presentation to the board. You can see on the upper left-hand corner of the picture that it was televised throughout the city, the school board meetings are televised and there were reporters there, we had some press and there were quite a few uh, concerned parents as well. So um, what you wanna do when you start doing this is take pictures and gather documentation, take pictures of applicators around your city. You can often see these guys with backpacks and gloves, sometimes hazmat suits, actually hopefully hazmat suits so that they're protected. But um, city park departments and school districts need to give you the records of what's going on. And you should also take pictures and sort of document where and when you saw things. Keep, start to keep a record. Um, here's a copy of the record that we got from Irvine. Uh, they gave us this information. Now over here, they sort of emphasized that they were only applying ounces of liquid. So it doesn't sound like so much. 
it'll say, you know, amount of concentrate applied, but really that's for gallons of liquid. One ounce converts to, I think it was 10 gallons. I can't remember the conversion. Um, I can give you that information later, but at, at any rate, it, they'll tell you about the ounces, but that's of concentrate. So keep in mind that it means more product than, than what it looks like. Um, develop a great logo. As social media is very important for your cause. As everyone knows, social media today is, is really a useful tool in gathering more people to your movement. Um, develop a logo and uh, at every meeting and every presentation be very professional. Also remember to stay on message. This is only about pesticide use in the community. Don't bring any other issues into it. Just stay on, on task, on focus, and um, no one will argue with you. Uh, set up a website and a Facebook page. See if you can find someone who's savvy with technical assistance, maybe even a teenager, to handle social media and get the word out. And every time you see a pesticide application happening, use Twitter, use Instagram, and keep people aware of what's going on. If there's going to be a meeting, uh, if there's anything new going on in your town, uh, go ahead and share that. Um, address a request to your city or your school district in letters and a petition first. Um, our group asked that the city immediately stop the application of toxic pesticides and switch to proven non-toxic and organic alternatives that are highly effective and are available at a cost comparable to the current pesticides being used. These alternatives also require 30% less water. This was the request that we made. We also attached a couple of scientific studies to that on our petition. There's the photograph we used on our petition. We used change.org. Change.org has a really nice function where every time someone signs, um, an email gets sent to the officials that you list on your email list. So all the city council members knew uh, the minute there was a new signature on our petition asking the city to also stop using toxic pesticides. Of course, the school district had already ended their process, so then we were going to the city, and then the city knew that there were a lot of people backing this decision. Um, here's a flyer briefly about a child who played baseball with my youngest son. Um, he's now deceased. He came down with a rare form of brain cancer, and we brought in the community of families of children with brain cancer, and as many of them who could show up to our meetings and sign our petitions did. And it helps to reach out to the community because these people are definitely thinking about what could have been in the environment that, that might have contributed to their child's condition. And you know, just the other day I heard of another 12 year old he's fighting for his life. And it's just wrong. I think all of us know children like this with these rare um, forms of cancer and it's really time to wake up to this and try and prevent this. These athletic kids are on these fields uh, many hours and many weekends and we should really think about what we're putting down before they come play. Uh, here's a picture of the group that was formed uh, after I had gotten the district to drop its pesticide use and um, we had press. It was really wonderful. They followed our progress throughout everything we were doing. Uh, so from the very beginning, ask journalists to follow your progress. See if you can find someone who is sympathetic to your cause, who will talk about the petition and your beginning of your movement and your various meetings and then hopefully your success and see if you can uh, contact multiple journalists in your area. Um, after you have a significant group together, and we really had this going in Irvine, we were getting decision makers meeting with us, they were uh, amenable to uh, changing what was happening in Irvine. Uh, we had raised awareness and they were actually listening, which was really amazing and a tribute to them. But um, all along I had been researching on uh, several sites of organizations that have information about pesticides and what you can do in your community to reduce pesticide use. And the organization that we got a lot of support from was Beyond Pesticides. There are other organizations like Pan Pesticide Action Network, and there are other really good organizations out there where you can find information. But Beyond Pesticides was a great resource for us. Uh, they have a lot of, you can see the resources button up in the top. They have a lot of scientific studies and information you can use to uh, compile um, 
together in a binder and then build your case. You can see here they're starting to track now the movement across the nation and they know what's going on in different parts of the community and if you make progress in your community, please contact them so that they can add you to their list. Uh, so compile a collection of scientific reports. You can get many of them just from Beyond Pesticides, but you may get them from other sources as well. Just make sure that they're very solid scientific reports that are published and peer reviewed. Um, this is a major report that we use from the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, regarding pesticide exposure in children. Um, this is a published study and they made no bones about it. They said, you know, it definitely damages their development. Very important to get rid of pesticides around children. Uh, the state of Connecticut and the state of New York have statewide bans uh, to protect students. In Connecticut, it's all K through 8 schools, and I believe in New York it may be the same law. I'm not sure exactly in New York what it is, but there, there are states that are already protecting children. Uh, I know in Connecticut there are a lot of parents pushing for the high schools to be free of pesticides, and I'm helping with that as well. Uh, it's extremely important that all children have the right to be learning and spend their days in a clean environment. Uh, request a meeting with officials. We met with the mayor, we met with a couple city council members. They met with us one at a time and we invited one of the scientists, one of the local scientists we had uh, gotten to be on our team to come to the meeting and so the questions that the mayor or the city council members had were, were answered immediately. Uh, if that's not possible, you can tell them you will get back to them, but it's really great if you can bring a landscape expert uh, and who's maybe even experienced in organic practices or open to organic practices and then also a scientist to answer questions. But if you can't, that's okay. Uh, keep it small and professional. Uh, be very courteous. Sorry, don't lose your cool. Um, just be very professional and remember this may be the first time that it's occurred to city leaders that this could be an issue. So um, be very calm and, and present your case and be very friendly because even if you don't convince them at first, uh, you may convince them later. You will definitely be getting them thinking after your meeting. Uh, this is Chip Osborne. Uh, we were lucky enough to get a grant from Beyond Pesticides. I applied for a grant uh, from them. Once we really got our city going, they started uh, considering giving us a grant. Uh, but you really have to be very far along in your process in order to, to get something like this. But they did cover the cost of sending Chip Osborne out and Jay Feldman, the director of Beyond Pesticides, accompanied him out. And it was wonderful because he taught our school maintenance guys uh, you know, about our grass and our particular system and our particular community and how to address problems without using toxic products. Um, that was wonderful to have him along. And, and he also gave presentations at City Hall. He gave two different presentations um, for community uh, landscapers so that they could also learn about alternative practices and have another resource because these guys are really good guys. It's just that they've only been trained by the chemical industry representatives. They have their little uh, certificate of education having gone through the training program and they are trained by people who are selling these toxic products so they've only been told that this is the only way to do it you must use the toxic products they work the best they cost the least it's the least amount of work for you and so you really have to get them on learning on a new path learning a new system it can be done it's tough for them and thank goodness they were open-minded in Irvine but uh, this is how it happened uh, this is our, one of the scientists who worked with us. Uh, his name is Dean Baker from UCI, and he um, helped in the meetings in coming up with a plan for a, a true IPM, Integrated Pesticide Management Plan. Um, what that means is that there's a list of pesticides that the city or the school district can use and they are limited to using only those pesticides. And we based ours largely on the city of San Francisco has a really good IPM that's very meaningful. And there are many IPMs out there that are just sort of, you know, the label is integrated pesticide management, but truly that just includes all the you know, really toxic pesticides. So your pesticide management program for your city or your school district has to have real meaning. And, meaning. and we based ours on San Francisco's, which is really pretty good. You're not alone. 
Um, these are names of, of many of the groups that we've documented that are in action now or have succeeded in making changes in their community. Um, it is tricky. It is a long road. As I said, I was in it for two years before we started to see change in our community. But given that the World Health Organization has come out with their study of glyphosate and so on, and awareness is really growing now, I think that your time could be much shorter in, in gaining success. But be patient. Um, these are some examples of really big success stories. Harvard University has gone organic several years ago, and they have a complete program where they use compost teas, and they keep the soil healthier, and when you keep the soil healthier, that in itself pushes out the weeds, and so you have less need for any product, and then if they do use any product, the products are organic. It's ironic, but these chemical systems kill the soil uh, and kill everything. And what happens is the bad weeds and the bad fungi explode. And then what do you need to do? You need to buy more product. That's on the chemical treadmill. That's the chemical system. That's the traditional system that most cities are using now. But if you stop all that and you care for the soil, your weeds will be taken care of. Your grass will look healthier. You won't have to use nitrates or petrochemical fertilizers anymore. And Harvard has this going on. Uh, there are other schools that have it going on as well. Um, Andover in New England has it, uh, that program. It's working very successful. And uh, other private high schools as well, or other public high schools, I should say. This is a public high school in Kentucky. Um, this field was actually donated to the school by a retired NFL player and his request was that he would donate the field but in order to donate it he had to always be kept with organic practices because he'd spent a lot of time on football fields and he realized the hazards. So this is very successful. You can see how lush and beautiful it is. This is a high use field. A lot of times you'll hear from maintenance guys that if it's a high use field you must use chemicals. That's what they've been taught, but actually the opposite is true. If the ground is healthy, the grass uh, will be more resilient uh, to sports activities and will actually hold up better than uh, chemically treated lawns. Uh, this photograph is courtesy of Tom Kelly of Be Safe Organic Lawn Care. He also did quite a bit of consultation uh, with me in Irvine as I went along in my journey. And uh, there are several professional organic landscapers like Tom who you can contact for advice and also uh, if your district has any money for training for the guys, instead of the guys going to the toxic program, uh, maybe they could have someone like Tom Kelly or Chip Osborne come in and teach them the organic methods. Uh, here's the city of Dover, New Hampshire. This is also Tom Kelly. Um, a friend of mine, Diana Carpinone, uh, managed to do this. She's, she deals with illness and she did most of this just from her home. Um, but she got the city to agree to designate a few public parks to try an organic program and Tom Kelly came up and he took care of the park. And this is after only one summer season of, of using the organic products. Look at the difference, same park. They gave him the nastiest park, the one that they thought would never be successful and he did a beautiful job with it. It's never looked better. Uh, these are the signs we see now in Irvine. It's so encouraging to see success, but uh, community associations, some of them in Irvine have gone um, on board. Those are, those are also known as HOAs, and uh, the residents live in sometimes gated communities, or they live in a community where they pay money to the HOA, Homeowners Association, and they uh, are in effect paying for the maintenance. So they're paying for the pesticides, they're paying for the maintenance and they should have a say. So if you can, get on the board of your homeowners association or go to some meetings and ask them to use uh, products that are not toxic. And it can be done. Um, and on the left is one of our parks that's actually attached to our public schools. In Irvine, the parks are attached to the schools. They're kind of one, one in one, they're seamless. And now we see organic signs. So it's wonderful instead of the warning signs we used to see, to see those signs. So to recap, uh, in the blueprint, raise awareness, get a partner or group together, stay on message, only talk about pesticides, have a very professional presentation, both in the materials you bring, the way you dress, and the way you comport yourself. Also, any materials you put online, uh, they should be very quiet and very you know, on message. Um, gather documentation and photos, make sure you have a lot of good material to bring into your meetings. Uh, gain the support of the press, 
um, get organizational and scientific support, uh, meet with officials bringing the binders, uh, gather a group for a larger public meeting, such as the city council meeting, um, offer to help obtain professional training for staff, or show that other towns are doing this successfully. There is expert advice out there. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Why don't you come back to, uh, to join me on screen? Okay. Um, if you can't, even work on your own. I know moms who are out there all by themselves uh, meeting with city council members, going to city council meetings, and just get out there. Get out there and start you know, being the squeaky wheel and start asking for this. And I believe, just like with me, uh, people will come forward who want to be on your team and want to work with you, and you will have success. I, I really feel as though this can happen in every community every city across the nation right now everyone can start so if you follow the blueprint you know you should be able to make good progress if you have questions there are places you can visit their associations such as non-toxic communities on uh, Facebook and they have a website where you can go for information and a little more support or if you've got the ball rolling and you want to start contacting beyond pesticides they will have resources for you their website is an amazing resource there's also a pesticide action network there are different organizations you can go to but I believe everybody can do one thing and you put one foot in front of the other and keep being the squeaky wheel. Just keep talking about it and just stay on point. And it's very hard to argue with this, this point that we need to take care of our children, that there's something going on with them and we need to go out and start paying attention to what we're spraying around our communities. Or heck, you know, even our husbands who golf. I've had women come to me and say, my husband's golfing every weekend. You know, what's he golfing in? What's that environment like? I mean, golf courses are another place that really could use a lot of change. And think of the maintenance guys that work there. So awareness is spreading. Awareness is spreading, but try to get a group going and just put one foot in front of the other and take a look at my blue print and maybe you can come up with other ideas of your own. Right. And uh, we're going to put all of the all of the information, all the resources that you mentioned on our website at rounduprisks.com so that everyone can simply cut and paste or, or print and download everything that they need to do what you did. And then there's other options as well and, and resources that you've already mentioned linked from there. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you, Jeffrey.